managing the machines. And um, I would like to welcome Firo Devitt to the stage. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, he's fine. He's like closing up on 20 steps of the day at the moment. Exactly. So at this point, I'm reduced to a packet of strepsils, two mics, and a clicker. Listen, I'm really excited to be here. This is as close to my community as I get. So I was joking with Joe earlier, I literally have given five talks this week and none of them have been people in the room that I knew or that did things I understood. <laughs> so it's actually incredibly exciting to be here at almost every level I can think of. I was just reminded that I was at IXDA in Dublin. Again, cold, wet, miserable. Like Seattle should be a really exciting time as a result of that. Um, so it's nice to be here. It's nice to be in Australia. I was back in the States last week and it's a strange time to be there and a strange time to be back here. It's also really nice to get to be able to say that I'm happy to be on Gadigal and Ural country. country. I realised the thing about having spent 30 years in the US is they never acknowledge they're on someone else's country. I took to actually doing acknowledgements of country in the US, which was an interesting exercise. <laughs> in fact, for those of you who are going to IXDA in Seattle, I fully recommend you should start your talks by acknowledging that you are on indigenous country because the entire of Seattle is a really important piece of traditional country and the traditional occupants are still there and they are always surprised when you actually acknowledge that to be the case. So if you are going to Seattle, that is my request as Australians, we should take that tradition elsewhere. It's actually a really powerful one and it's nice to be able to reflect on it not just as a reflexive act but as something that actually means something. And particularly as an expat coming home, I am struck by how much it continues to mean to me. So I'm happy to be home, I'm happy to be talking about new and interesting things and I thought what I'd do was take advantage of the fact that I'm in this strange liminal position in my own life. I have spent 20 years in Silicon Valley, 30 years in America. I tried to quit last year and did it really badly. Um, so of all the logos I could add on the bottom of that talk, I should actually legitimately still add the Intel logo because although I left the company and moved myself to a different country and took a new job, I'm still on the books, which is a really good trick and one day I will tell you all how I did it. <laughs> But in the meantime, I remain a vice president and senior fellow at Intel and I am still part and parcel of that company. So that's unexpected. In the rest of my life, I now find myself as a distinguished professor at the Australian National University. That is also unexpected and a little odd. Probably the oddest part about that is that I am a distinguished professor inside the College for Computer Science and Engineering. <laughs> where they do in fact know I'm an anthropologist and are very frightened by that fact. Um, and I haven't entirely decided what they should do with me. Uh, so mostly they pretend I'm not there, which is genuinely excellent. Because having spent 20 years at Intel and it took 18 of those 20 years for my colleagues to realize I was doing field work not just for them but on them. Um, <laughs> ANU is now my second field site. And I have a comparative tribe. They turn out to be remarkably similar, sadly, for me. <laughs> All right, so what I thought I'd do was, as I get to be in this kind of unexpected place, I thought I'd actually look back on at least the last 10 years of work we'd been doing at Intel and reflect on some of the threads I've been hearing through all of the different ways we were encountering human beings. So field work, qualitative, quantitative, just the kind of stuff we were seeing, and pull out some of what I think are the persistent threads that ran through all of that work. I don't have answers here, I just have a series of questions and I think those questions should be framing the way we think about all manner of different kinds of work. Because it strikes me, these were the last 10 years, but when I looked at this list I went, oh shit, that's actually the 10 years before that too. So my suspicion is they're persistent threads and I just want to kind of pull on them a little bit and see where it gets us. There's all the usual ways we could introduce myself, I did the two now, I'm a professor and I'm still a vice president, good trick. Um, I'm also, for most of you know, I'm a cultural anthropologist by training. I'm also the daughter of an anthropologist. So I grew up on my mother's field sites in central and northern Australia in her brief excursions into Indonesia. I spent most of my childhood, if I wasn't in school in Canberra, mostly not in school in the Northern Territory. I spent most of that part of my childhood living on a place those, those days called Warabri, now called Ali Karang. So a Walpuri, Kaidich, Aliara and Waramungu settlement about 350 kilometres north of Alice. It had been established in the 1960s when we were there in the 1970s. It was still a relatively new settlement. The people that were there at that moment in time remembered 
what their country was like before cattle and fences and Europeans. And they took my brother and I and my mother onto their country and told us their stories. And so most of that part of my childhood involved being in a bilingual classroom, speaking Walpuri in the morning and English in the afternoons. It involved going hunting and gathering constantly. It involved being barefoot, grubby, and getting to kill things and then eat them. I hasten to add, just in case I sound like a budding sociopath. <laughs> and it was an extraordinary childhood. It was like the most remarkable gift and the most incredible way to get to know my own country. And when I came back the first time from being in Central Australia and ended up in Canberra, I encountered a set of stories about Aboriginal people that I didn't recognise. They weren't the people I'd just been with. They weren't the communities I'd been on. They were things I didn't recognise. And it was incredibly difficult to try and make sense of all of that. And my mum sat my brother and I down and said, listen, here's the thing. The world we live in isn't the way it should be. We have choices to make about what we want that world to be like and the people that you know in the Northern Territory have a right to be in those stories in a way that they aren't but for that to happen things are going to have to change. And so she said to my little brother and I here's the deal you know in order to make change you're actually going to have to be willing to stand up and do things. You have a capacity to drive change if you're willing to put your time, your intellect, your energy, your passions, perhaps one day your life on the line for things. And she basically told my brother and I that you had a moral obligation to make the world a better place. And that's a pretty heady thing to tell a 10 year old. And sometimes I look back and I think, interesting parenting, mum, but okay. <laughs> but what it made very clear to me from that moment forward was that there were choices you made about the things that you did and the ways that you lived your life. And those choices in some ways for me have governed where I've worked, what I've done, why I have chosen to do the things I did. It's what took me to the United States, it's what kept me in anthropology, it's what took me into a PhD program, it's why I studied Native American studies, it's why I did feminist theory, it's why I was doing queer and Marxist theory. You can see how I'd end up at Intel, right? <laughs> Obvious connection, because in 1998 what Intel desperately needed was a woman who did queer, queer theory, feminist theory and Native American studies. In fact, you should get me one of those, that looks like a really good idea. But I ended up at Intel. Many of you know I went there because it was an opportunity to do something different. It was certainly a very early time in the valley and in American industry to have anthropologists in technology. I'm fairly certain I was the first of that second generation after Lucy Suchman and Victoria Bellotti and Julian Orr. And it was an extraordinary period of my life. But about two years ago I looked around and I said I'm not making things anymore. I was in our strategy office, I was helping set strategy, it was a fascinating intellectual journey but it wasn't particularly satisfying. And at that moment in time the Vice Chancellor of the Australian National University came knocking and said it's time to come home. And I said no because you know it didn't seem like it was time to come home. And then he said to me that the university wanted to build something new and do something different. And I asked him how far he was willing to go with that and he asked me what it was that I had in mind and I said that the last five years of my life I had been looking at what was happening in Silicon Valley and with technology and I was pretty clear we were standing on the precipice of a fundamental shift in how technology worked. The compute was going from a command and control infrastructure to something very different. Not that command and control compute was going away but that this next wave of computing was coming and that the terms of how that computing would unfold would feel very different. The World Economic Forum calls that move the fourth wave of the Industrial Revolution. Other people talk about cyber physical systems. A lot of us have been talking about AI, machine learning and algorithms. But I actually looked at all of that and said I don't think any of that's the right framing. The closest I can get to thinking is that AI is just the steam engine. No more, no less. And what we should be talking about is the train, the railway, the largest system that's being built. And so I said to the Vice Chancellor of the Australian National University, I will come home on one condition. You have to let me build the applied science that will manage that world. You have to let me build a new academic discipline that will be the thing that contends with that new train and that new railway system. And he went, OK. <laughs> and I went, uh-huh. So I called him back and went, you do understand what I've just said to you, right? <laughs> Like, I think I've just said I want to build a new applied science. And the last time I remember anyone saying that is George Forsyth in 1962. And he went, yeah. And I went, okay, how do you feel about that? He said, oh, it's a bit ambitious. 
<laughs> I went, okay. And he said, so when are you coming home? <laughs> okay. So at the moment, I'm on a grand adventure to build a new applied science and a new academic discipline. At some point, I'll be standing in this line right here going, I'm hiring and I expect some of you to apply. In the meantime, let me tell you what else I think is going on. So I know we all know this quote. Many of us put it in PowerPoint presentations. William Gibson, happily, in The Economist in 2003 said, future's already here, it's just unevenly distributed. I went back and looked in my vast trove of crazy to see where I was in 2003, because it struck me it might be interesting to imagine what was I doing when he said the future was already here. And I found this photo. I didn't take this photo. Larissa Horath at RMIT took this photo when she was doing work in Tokyo. But that photo was taken on a train platform in 2003, right as Gibson is declaring the future's already here, it's just unevenly distributed. The thing about that photo is, that looks like 2018. That doesn't look like 2003. That looks like now. If I were to put this photo up and I didn't tell you what date it was, you'd think they were a bit daggy, but you wouldn't go, it's 15 <laughs> years ago. You'd just go, oh, sad shoes. Um, <laughs> but you wouldn't immediately look at that and think that's the past. Except <coughs> many of us in this room, and me certainly, I sat in executive meetings in 2003, and I said, that stuff right here is really important. There's mobile phones in everyone's hands. They're doing location-based services. People were doing dating based on where they were. They were doing chat. They were already swapping things that look remarkably like emoji. They were doing all kinds of things. And the people that I worked with went, eh, that's just Docomo, which was the Japanese telco. They went, eh, that's just Japan. They went, they're weird. I'm like, well, that's good. Let's just write off a whole country with they're weird. Or, oh yeah, stuff happens in Japan and never happens anywhere else. And I'm like, yeah, okay, maybe, but like, or not. But there were a whole lot of things happening right there in 2003 that actually looked perfectly normal in 2018. So at one level, Gibson's absolutely right. The future was already right there in 2003. We were just ignoring it or declaring it as an outlier. And so in some ways, my question to myself almost every day is what am I looking at that says the future's already here and I'm just ignoring it. Now, I say that with the caveat that having spent five years as a futurist, one of the nicest pieces of advice I ever got given was that it is incredibly easy to conflate a near horizon and a clear distance. That we don't always know exactly how far things are away and it is very easy to be taken with all the kind of blather about new technologies and not to maintain a critical voice and a critical edge but I do sometimes think around us is lurking the future. We just don't even know how to see it. So against that backdrop, like I said, I've been looking at all the stuff that we've been doing for a long time and I started to say, are the bits of the future I was already seeing or bits of the past that we still haven't fixed or contended with? And I came down to a list of 10 things that I think are either really fierce problems or really stubborn opportunities or some combination of both. And every single one of these is something that we heard in the field, that we saw in one of our studies, of something someone said to us about technology, about the future, about the world they were living in. And every single one of them, for me, bangs around inside my head because I don't think we know quite how to talk about it yet. So 10 things. First one is, we are deeply obsessed with Silicon Valley. And guess what? Almost no one lives there. And there's only about 3 million people in the valley all up. There's like 7 billion people on the planet, nearly 7.5, they're not all there. And some of the stuff that gets built there doesn't work anywhere else. In fact, much of it doesn't. The imagination of the world that starts there isn't most of the worlds we live in. The stories that get told there about disruptions in business models and about possibilities, not only are technically complicated elsewhere, but rely on ideas about infrastructures that do not scale. I took that photograph in 2008 in Loxton, South Australia. Excellent CWA op shop. <laughs> Particularly good bakery. The internet, however, turns out to be a destination in Loxton <laughs> where you can go to it. Now, I would like to imagine that in the 10 years that have passed, Australia has solved its telecommunications problems. <laughs> I really, I would. I'd love to imagine that was true. Um, I think it probably hasn't. 
And I think as we talk about next generation technologies, every time someone tells you a story about autonomous cars, you shouldn't just think to yourself, is that technically possible? You should think to yourself, what is the network on which that data is going to travel that will make those vehicles function? What else is going to need to function on those networks? Oh, by the way, what does the road look like and who's maintaining it? How do you think about the rule system and the signage? Because all of that stuff turns out to be as important as the technology. And almost none of it looks like what the world looks like in Menlo Park or Sunnyvale and particularly not Palo Alto. So how we imagine the starting places of technology, Mary perfectly reasonably said, you know, there are externalities that get built into objects and I'd imagine it's worse than that. We take our imagination cues from a very limited number of places. And one of the things that human beings routinely told us was we don't live in that place you think we live. Either we don't have the data rates, we don't have the bandwidth, we don't have the money, we don't have those devices. We are actually still trying to work out how to make our public transportation system function. Please don't tell me about autonomous cars. Like, total mismatch of technological possibilities and prospects. So how we think about grounding our work and grounding our activities in the realities of the places we're in, not that we should be limited by them, but we should be attentive to them. And remembering that not every good idea started in Silicon Valley might be a useful starting place. Second thing, used to hear this a great deal and I've heard it again recently, is people saying to me, things used to be a lot more simple. And on the one hand, you can hear that as a kind of nostalgia that echoes through the ages. People have been saying it was a lot more simple for at least 100 years. <laughs> and it's almost never true. Like, you know, whatever they imagine was more simple is in fact part of a nostalgia about the way we talk about the past. All of that said, I'm willing to bet if I nicked a phone out of any one of your hands at the moment, it looks more complicated than the last phone you had. You probably do about the same number of things on it, but it's harder to do many of them than it used to be. It is also the case that for many human beings, many of us in this room I imagine are early adopters, most of the world is not. For many human beings, we are building a proliferation of objects that are in fact not simple. Answer a phone. Not simple in a smartphone. Surprisingly complicated making phone calls on phones. <laughs> Shouldn't be that difficult and yet is surprisingly difficult. Think about all of the small little tiny objects you have in your world. And then think about trying to reboot them. Hard to reboot an Alexa. Hard to reboot a Fitbit. I've watched people attempt to reboot smart cars recently. That was a good exercise. <laughs> I was in one of these. The guy looked at me and said, I'm going to have to turn the whole thing off and turn it on again. I said, and then what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to count to 30. I'm like, <laughs> you want a paper clip? Like, I remember this. Like, how is it that we imagine a whole series of mechanisms we grew up with of thinking about how you fix things as you turn them on and you turn them on again? Not necessarily going to work for a smart building fairly certain it doesn't scale to smart cities, a little concerned about what it might look like and all the points in between. And that's just not the only thing people ask when they say it used to be simple. What we also heard was that people used to think there was one person they could call. Who is that person? I was in a lift in California, so shared, shared taxi ride service, and the guy said to me, if something goes wrong, I don't have a mechanism to contact Lyft to say something's happened. There's not a single button on my screen of displays from them. There's no one button to call them and say, there's been an accident, something's happened to this person. He's like, the best I can do is call 911. And he looked at that and said, I'm operating as an extension of this brand, and yet I have no mechanism to communicate with them. And that was an interesting moment where I thought, well, that's fascinating. But then scale that up or scale it back, right? When was the last time you tried to call Oh, pick a service provider in your life. Really, just pick one of them. And imagine calling them. Yeah, and that's the noise you make. Mm. It's bad. And then imagine a complexity of those where there isn't the washing machine repair person who would come and fix the washing machine. You now have to imagine a complex of characters who may or may not fix the problem, know how to deal with the knock-on consequences of is the problem the device, the network, the service, 
Where is the outage in <coughs> that array and how do you think about troubleshooting it? And back to this notion of how do you become a good ancestor, there's also a notion of how do we imagine that the things we build will break? <coughs> and when they break, what is the path to non-breakage? Like what's the pathway by which things get fixed? Who do we imagine is responsible? How do we imagine that responsibility should happen? What is an appropriate time frame in which that would happen? How do you get skilled about it? I'm willing to bet most of us don't do a terribly good job of documenting our work. Not looking at you explicitly, <laughs> but I am. <laughs> Just I can tell by the way you squirmed. Guilty. So how do we think about Simple isn't a design value in this sense, but there is a notion about whether complexity is necessarily a good thing and what it means to imagine that every object that's getting created isn't the only object people have. That is, in fact, an incredibly complicated array of things. Turns out to be something we've heard in every conversation I can think of in a decade. Third thing people always say, which I think is particularly interesting, it's this sort of notion of, it's really nice that you tell me you can put it all in one place, but I'm not sure I want you to. So, sure, you can back everything up off my phone. I don't know how I feel about you backing everything up off my phone. Or, it's nice you have my content, but I don't want all my content in one place. Or, my personal favorite from inside my own company, where we were in a conference room, four of us. We were sketching out a roadmap for the next two years' worth of technology deployments. This would not be an unfamiliar story. Someone else had the conference room booked. We'd written the entire thing on a whiteboard, and they were kicking us out. <laughs> a familiar scenario. So someone just took a picture of the whiteboard, which is great. They're like, great, we've got a photo. We all sent it to each other. We moved on. About two hours later, one of my colleagues who'd been in this room called all of us and went, we have a problem. We're like, what? We've all got the photo. He's like, yeah, so does my wife. I'm like, what? Why does your wife have a copy? And wait, doesn't she work at Qualcomm? I'm like, that's not good. <laughs> and he's like, well, so we have this protocol where every photo that gets taken on all of our phones gets backed up to the same cloud. And she just called me and went, um, I don't want to look at this. Can you delete it? And so we had this really interesting moment where a protocol for saving content didn't know the appropriate context in which it should or shouldn't be saved. It knew that it should be saved. It didn't know where it was or that it maybe shouldn't be saved to the same place that things always get saved. So, one of the problems is, as human beings, we spend all of our time policing the boundaries in our lives. We dress differently in certain circumstances, we talk differently, apparently we do and don't say shit from right here. Mary is much better behaved than I am in that regard. <laughs> we know there are contacts, right? We contact shift. Our devices don't know how to do that half as well. And our data knows how to do it even more poorly than that. And how we think about what it means to imagine you may not want everything in one place is an interesting problem to think about how you design for and around, particularly as we also live in a world where there are actors who want all your data to be in one place, preferably with them. Preferably in a place they can either, well, I don't know, retain it or monetize it or scrape it or make sense of it in some way. So how we think about the tensions there is an interesting, again, problem that only gets more acute, it doesn't get easier. Fourth one, oh, it's the password problem. <laughs> and you all laugh because you all have this problem. <laughs> this is a mate of mine who had a book, and in that book were written all the passwords. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, on the one hand, bless. On the other hand, bless. Um, so <laughs> all the passwords. And he had complicated algorithms for how he updated them, which he did regularly. So, you know, the password wasn't the same. It would get written down and it would get crossed out. He had interesting additive practices of, you know, sometimes he added two numbers on the end that went sequentially, sometimes algorithmically. I mean, it was this incredibly complicated thing. Interestingly, he always had this book with him. And in this particular moment of time, he and I are in a restaurant in San Diego. He lived in Melbourne. It was late afternoon in San Diego, and his kids are calling from Melbourne. Dad, Dad, Netflix went down. What's the password? <laughs> Matt's like, I have no idea. He's like, I just need to find this. And so he opens the book, goes to the Netflix page, and then goes, oh, shit, I changed it. 
And I'm like, okay. He's like, and I didn't write down the new password. I'm like, what is this book for exactly? <laughs> He's like, why do you have it all in one place? I'm like, yeah, except the password. He's like, yeah, I know, but it'll be only one of three things. So then he texts those to his kids. Now, that's an extreme example, but I'm willing to bet most of us are managing some kind of strategy for how we use passwords. Many of you are managing it very, very poorly <laughs> because you are using the same password for everything. And you know you're doing it poorly and you know you shouldn't and you do it anyway because it turns out doing anything else looks like this <laughs> and this doesn't scale. So every service requires a password. Most of those passwords have to be compliant to the system, which is not the same as all the other systems. So there'll be some complicated thing of capitals versus lowercase, numeric versus alpha, six to nine, but sometimes 12. Could be a word, shouldn't be a word, might be in English, more numbers better. <laughs> maybe. OK. So you've got all of that, and that's multiple services. If you're lucky, maybe your device remembers them. That's not always a good thing, because now you've created a different set of problems, because your device knows all those passwords. And if you lose your device, see the book problem and see someone else now has access to everything. And now scale that up and out. So that's just for apps and services. Now imagine a world of many, many other things where passwords are no longer the right answer. For all kinds of reasons, right? Do you really want to have a password for your smart thermostat? Because you're only going to need to put it in there about three times when the power goes out. Multiple problems about smart thermostats and power going out and passwords. But do you really want to use a password for your thermostat? Because you're never going to write it down with the thermostat. You're going to put it somewhere really sensible and never be able to find it. But it is a digital object and someone will require one, so see that problem. Then imagine all the other objects that may or may not require passwords. And then think about the fact that passwords is one of the least adequate solutions for security, possibly in the history of humanity, <laughs> with maybe the notable exception of keys, which weren't very good either. And then think about what are all the possible options that we have come past to move past that. Biometrics, that was a good one. So as of two years ago, the United States had its, I forget what it is sequentially, but the largest single theft of personal identification information stolen from the United States government happened about two years ago. 25 million individual personal records, included in which were a million fingerprints. So actually 10 million fingerprints, but a million individuals' fingerprints. Now, it is one thing to change your password. It's another thing to get a new credit card. I have a complicated set of questions about how you're going to get new fingerprints. <laughs> so biometrics, not necessarily a good thing. We could use other parts of our bodies. Voice is one. But at the moment, I sound more like Mae West and less like myself. And <laughs> if you were using a voice system, it may not recognize me. We know you could use biological material like DNA, but we know that somewhere between 5 to 15% of people have multiple strands of unique DNA sitting inside them. They're chimeric. So in fact, that doesn't work. So how we think about solving this problem turns out to be persistent. And oh, by the way, we now need to think about how do you secure not just the device and the service and the application, but also the network, the data, the algorithm, the data farm. And all of that means thinking about how we imagine security is a ground up process, not an added on the end process. And frankly, I think we might be better served here to imagine that what we are dealing with is not security, which implies we might achieve it, but more like how we would manage insecurity. And that inversion there of saying it's not about security practices, it's about insecurity practices might get us somewhere much more interesting speculatively. Rather than imagining we can actually get to perfect security, how do you manage down risks? And that one only gets more acute because this solution. Oh, and by the way, my favorite thing about that book is it has password written on the front of it. <laughs> <laughs> and before you all laugh, I can statistically guarantee there are people in this room who have a folder on their device called passwords in which they have their passwords or an Excel spreadsheet. And you don't need to nod, but I know it's true. <laughs> so running down the list. Number five, maybe it's six here. One of the things we also started to see, and this was true nearly a decade ago, but as you have moved increasingly into a world of recommendation engines and data-driven services, there is an increasing anxiety on the part of human beings about why things are being recommended to them 
Think of this as the extension of the privacy problem. We used to think that it was about privacy. I increasingly think it is about privacy and also about reputation. So is how is that data being used? What assessment is being made about me and what judgment is being rendered on top of it? And why on earth did you recommend that movie to me? Like, what have you decided about me that you think I need to watch that? <laughs> also, why that service? Also, why that pair of shoes? Which seems benign, but may not be. Also, why that travel destination? Why that government service versus another one? And what we started to see, at least in our own material, was that consumers were increasingly, human beings, were increasingly anxious, not about privacy per se, but about what assessments were being rendered on the top of the data that was being collected about them and how that data was being combined in new and unexpected and novel and complicated ways and how that data was being used in ways they didn't necessarily opt into. One of the things we saw in the US in this time period, in fact, was a series of um, another ongoing court cases about precisely this, one of which came from a managed healthcare company in the US who had about 20 million subscribers. If you subscribe to a healthcare service, but let's imagine you do. They had 20 million patients, and they went and bought the credit card data of their 20 million patients and combined the credit card data and the healthcare data because they could technically nothing to stop them wasn't anything to stop them at law at first what they said was we have done this at a high level of anonymization we've not matched individual records we've just matched record sets and in order to make it seem less um, scary they released a couple of key findings that they had found as a result of that uh, which they thought were kind of funny and would minimise the like, deeply disturbing factor here. Uh, first one was that there was a correlation, possible causation, uh, between flat pack IKEA and furniture purchases and emergency room admissions. <laughs> Especially on Friday nights. So if you thought that Allen key was dangerous, you were not alone. <laughs> and everyone kind of went, oh, that's kind of funny. And then it became clear that they were also doing things like saying, well, you went to Macca's five times a month, so we're reconsidering your um, health care provisioning because your cholesterol isn't where you said it was going to be and you said you were looking after your diet and now we know you aren't. But of course, what starts to happen in there is how do you know that's your credit card that's being used? Is that the food being consumed by you? What judgments will get rendered on top of other kinds of purchases where you then start to imagine incredibly normative values being placed on top of purchases. What makes you a risk? You purchased condoms, you purchased McDonald's food, you purchased alcohol, you purchased certain books, you purchased an esky and a chainsaw. What, only in Australia obviously, and only in South Australia. Um, but you know, what would make you a risk in that instance, right? And then, who is deciding that's risky behaviour? And what other normative judgments get layered into that? What possible review is made of it? What are the legal implications of that? Now, technically, we know you could make it really difficult for certain kinds of data sets to be commingled. It's not that hard. You'd use anything between meta tagging to certain kinds of opt-in parameters around how data got shared. And if, you know, Joe's healthcare data turned up with his credit card data, one of them could literally call him and go, hey, do you know that I'm hanging out with your healthcare data? Did you think I was going to go there? I didn't think I was going to go there, and we could do something about it. Technically, no one is doing that currently, but you could. We could certainly manifest it at law. Imagine what happens if certain data sets get commingled and evaluations are based on it. Even if you unmingle the data, the evaluation persists. Now think about that inside the framework of, say, oh, I don't know, government services. Oh, It's not surprising that humans weren't sort of were a bit worried about this. Their worry started with why Netflix was sending them things, but it got much quicker, much deeper, very fast about what was going on there. This sign, which I'm going to make you all pause and read, and then I'm going to tell you where it is persistently in America. This is also so I can have water and strepsils. <laughs> and I want to guess where this sign most regularly can be found in the United States. Yes, ma'am. Hospital? No, but close. Post office? Mm. Chemist. 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 So outside most drugstores and chemists in America, on the garbage bin right outside the front door, you find this sign. Mm. 
Yeah, I know. <laughs> I thought, found one and then I thought, that's kind of creepy. And then I found like every drugstore and went, oh my God, like what does that tell us about all sorts of things? Well, one of the things it starts to ask is, how is data circulating about us? How do we think at a kind of human scale about how long data lasts? Most people have um, tacit formulations about how long certain kinds of data gets kept. We keep bank records for about seven years. We probably keep you know, medical data as long as we possibly can. I'm willing to bet many of us have photos from school we wish we didn't keep, but we still do. And our parents are persistently keeping things about us we wish they would stop doing. And the children who you have that you are keeping things of will think this about you later. So stuff gets stored, we know that, right? What we don't always know is who's storing it, how they're storing it, why and what they plan to do with it. And also what the conditions are by which that data will move later. So if you had purchased a Misfit, so one of the early fitness tracking objects that was a Kickstarter campaign, I purchased one. It was lovely. It was the first waterproof fitness tracker you could have, so I used it for swimming. And it was nicely designed. It was actually a beautiful piece of industrial design. So nice was it that Fossil bought it. And suddenly my Kickstarter product became a Fossil product and my data went from Misfit to Fossil. And I didn't get a say in that. And suddenly a different company owned all of my data because I didn't own it, not in the United States. In Europe I would have, but not there or here. So now a whole lot of data generated by my body with whom I thought I'd had a social contract with the company because I'd given them money and they'd given me an object. The object went somewhere else and so did all of my data. I didn't because I made a choice about that and I knew enough to know what I was doing. Not everyone does and not everyone can be that cavalier about it. If that is a merging of your bank, your credit card company, your mortgage holder, you know, suddenly data is now moving in unexpected ways. We don't know how long it's being kept. We don't always know why it's being kept. We don't know under what conditions or how you might get it back. So for lots of human beings, the notion about what do you know about me and at what point do you plan to forget that is an interesting question, right? And that can be anything from the small cookies that get installed all the time that remember that it's you, to the shoes that follow me across the internet, to other things. But the notions here about how long in particular are things being stored was a question we kept hearing. Now, part of the reason people don't have answers to that is that not everyone who's storing data has decided how long they're keeping it, which is an interesting challenge right there, right? And even as we think about doing work in-house, one of the fascinating transitions for me of moving from a university to industry was thinking about how did you do informed consent in an industry context? How long did we keep information about the people we studied and under what circumstances? So we we're on the hook here for completely different reasons. How we think about the stories we tell about people we spent time with, we're part and parcel of this question too, right? How long are we gonna keep those stories in circulation? We're not off the hook ethically and morally either. And then you get to this moment in time, which is the moment where someone says to you, it's creepy. What's wonderful about this phrase is that it is um, not a human universal truth, but I've heard it in more cultural context than I've heard most things. And what it turns out that phrase comes up about is when you get to a, um, what we once might have called a privacy violation, but usually now it's when the data gets just a little too close and the determination gets just a little too close to you that it starts to get profoundly uncomfortable. <laughs> um, for me, the first time this happened, and I'm sure we all have stories about this, right? For me, it was the first time this happened. I wandered up to an ATM, I stuck my card in, and the ATM wished me a happy birthday. <laughs> and I thought, well, sure, you know my birthday. I mean, like, you know, you've got a lot of my banking details. I'm sure at some point I had to tell you how old I was. But like, why are you doing that? <laughs> like, that's just weird. So I don't really think anything more of it other than thinking, mm, creepy. And then six months later, same ATM, well, at least same bank, stuck my card in and it wished me a happy anniversary. And I thought, and yet I'm single. <laughs> and anniversary for what? And with whom? And then I realized the bank was wishing me a happy anniversary with the bank. <laughs> I know, with flowers and champagne on the screen, not in real life. Um, and at the time I thought to myself, okay, so 
That would be what personalization looks like when it goes horribly, horribly <laughs> wrong. And well done for thinking you have all this data and you know me, so you should tell me about that. Not so well done for thinking about what the right line might be there around how you might do that. So one of the temptations here I know as we think about design, as we think about, well, architecting, all manner of encounters with technology is the temptation is to demonstrate that we know the people that are using our things. You are known. We, like, we know as if that can be a good thing, right? The challenge here is how do we operate inside a world with a tremendous amount of data without happy anniversary from the bank? Because <laughs> creepy. <laughs> And everyone has a moment of this. It's actually a really interesting ethnographic question to ask people about what their creepy moments are with data, because they will always tell you. And they have very clear memories of ones that were disturbing at some level. I'm willing to bet most of you do, where you can think of one where you went, oh, that's just unpleasant. Like, no, thank you. So thinking about this as a test for me became one of the ways we tested things, of going, could anyone conceivably find this creepy? And I think we are in a moment in time where that has added valence that we ought to possibly be attending to even more than we usually do. So how we think about that as a notion of what a privacy violation looks like, it may be an easier way, at least we found it an easier way into a conversation about privacy than asking people about privacy, which is sometimes a more complicated conversation to have and not always one that you can easily get into. And then of course, oh, one of my very favorite ethnographic moments recently, we were doing instrumentation of homes. We had deployed a system that was looking at uh, water usage. So basically a smart water meter. We told the households we were doing it. They knew that was happening. We did a data visualization pattern with them over the space of a month. We tracked their water usage, you know, fine. We were in households at the end of this process. And in one of the very first households, husband and wife couple, looking at their data pattern, and they've obviously had water bills for like a significant period of time. They've just never seen it broken down on an hour-by-hour hour kind of, you know, visualization of the water use in the home. And there's this clear spike every afternoon in the water usage, about 2 o'clock, maybe 3. And it becomes clear that's a washing machine being run. And husband says to wife, seriously, why does the washing machine go every day? She's like, um... Because you won't wear clothes more than once. And he says, yeah, but why is the washing machine going every day? <laughs> She's like, so there are clean clothes every day. He's like, has the washing machine always gone every day? She's like, how long have you liked clean clothes? <laughs> and he's like, but that means the washing machine's been going every day for 20 years. And she's like, how is it you've never noticed? <laughs> and we're sort of stepping away at this point, <laughs> like going, okay, excellent. And what became clear in that moment was something really interesting, is that we often talk about, when I hear it said to me sometimes, that more data will equal more truth, and that more data and more visualizations and transparency will be great. The reality is sometimes the consequence of that is it makes tacit patterns suddenly explicit, and then you have to think about what you want to do with them. And I can make an argument about why it is that the partner in this relationship should have known that his wife was washing his damn clothes every day, and he probably should have said thank you more often. But I can also argue about why it is that we're not necessarily equipped to think about what happens when things that were tacit suddenly become explicit. And that runs the gamut from what it means to visualize everything from how water is being used to how money gets trafficked to how you move through a city to how much exercise you have is that as human beings as human beings in social relationships as human beings inside cultures and countries what it means to think about making our tacit habits not so tacit is really complicated and it involves relationships of power it involves ideas about vulnerability it involves ideas about making things that were sometimes open secrets, public secrets. And I'm willing to bet in Australia right now, we know exactly what that looks like. <laughs> and it's interesting. I say that having had to answer those questions in America of late, what exactly does your deputy prime minister do? I'm like, well, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the things that starts to happen as you have all these devices doing things. This was a lovely spoof that turned up on the internet not that long ago of someone imagining what a smart home might say to you. Um, 
<laughs> you haven't left the house in five days. Okay. Um, one of the things we started to hear from people, we talked about what it would be like to live in an instrumented world, where we talked about what it would be like to have these smart water meters that were talking to the utility company, to have your electrical meter negotiating rates for you, to have your solar system putting electricity back into the grid, to have your fridge know how much was in it and it be talking to your services. All the things that we talk about as being about efficiencies. One of the first things human beings said back to us was, wait, so is my electrical meter like gossiping about me behind my back? And you're like, well, it's certainly communicating to the utility company. They're like, yeah, it's gossiping. I'm like, it's a digital device. Like, yep, feels like gossip. I'm like, well, okay, I could see that almost immediately, right? Was that what they saw was an object, again, rendering judgment. And that it didn't feel like it was a machine to machine communication. It felt like something quite different. It felt like gossip. And it's interesting that that's the language that people went to. It's also interesting to think about how are those transactions going to take place? How do we think about what it means to have objects that may have different intents than we do? It's certainly technically possible now to have, if you had a smart electrical meter and the right kind of wiring system in your home, it would be possible to down the wire through your grid, turn off certain appliances. So if you wanted to load shed as an electrical utility rather than shedding suburbs, you could just shed all the air conditioners and you could explicitly target them. You could target particular households. You could target particular neighborhoods. You could target people who hadn't paid their electrical bills. There's all sorts of things that that degree of engagement makes possible. And there's all kinds of ways where those objects then are uh, in relationships with people that aren't you, where you don't necessarily get the same degree of transparency that you might get from the water meter about your water habits. So at the very moment some things are being made explicit, other things are in some ways, if not disappearing, getting disguised in manners that people found to be quite challenging. Which, you know, leaves us with this one last and final thought, which is that people keep, or they say to me, the robots are gonna kill us, right? Like, <laughs> Yeah, pretty much. Um, There's the three questions I'm being asked at the moment. When will the robots kill us? When will the singularity happen? And cryptocurrencies discuss. I'm like, <laughs> okay. Those don't feel like the same question, but all right, good. So, you know, the robots are going to kill us is clearly a conversation that has been ongoing in the Western imagination since at least the 60s. You can go back and look at conversations about early automation, about factory replacement. It is certainly a story that has run through our socio-technical imagination for at least, well, it is the 200th anniversary of Frankenstein, so we know that story's got a bit of traction. Um, you know, it is the story that was, well, you know, kill John Connor. You know, the Terminator sequence is very much about a kind of reimagining of the Terminator story, but also a cultural trope about managing the anxiety of job loss. So we know that you know, those robot stories have a particular kind of currency. In some ways, those stories in the last 18 months, I'd say, have given way to stories about AI. But AI is just the robot without the case. I mean, it is the same set of stories and it is the same set of anxieties. Um, I think it's sometimes really easy to laugh at those anxieties or to amplify them, and neither of those are helpful. I think one of the challenges we all have as people who are building the interfaces and are worrying about what this world will look like is the temptation is to be either utterly dystopic or utterly utopian, and I don't know how to thread that needle effectively. I do know we all need to do a much better job of remembering that those anxieties are not irrational. The introduction of most new technologies didn't go as planned. The history of the 20th century is full of technologies that we were told were gonna fix everything and fixed almost nothing, or technologies that were gonna change everything and changed almost nothing. And we also know that you know, there are clear uh, cultural reference points about things going awfully wrong. Mary had Oppenheimer and he's a good starting point for the 20th century of things that can be done that didn't go as possibly well as planned. Or maybe they went exactly as planned and that's the problem. So how we think about doing justice to the fear as well as being appropriately critical about the utopia is for me part and parcel of how we also actively talk about the future.
because I think one of the things that threads through the last decade of the work I've been doing is very much about how technology is co-located with stories about the future and how those stories are always only one of two things, intensely utopian or intensely dystopian. And all of us, all of our work sits in the middle between those two places, right? And I think there's something about how we talk about both the love and fear of the future that is a useful exercise and is always hard work. How do you give technology a backstory and a history as well as a future is an interesting challenge, but I always think a good one. Which, you know, leads me to kind of say, well, what would it mean to make humans? Like, you know, if we're part of where we're going is all of those problems, they all come with us, right? Every single one of those challenges doesn't get obviated because we're now talking about AI, not second life. <laughs> it doesn't change because we're now talking about algorithms, not mobile phones. All these challenges, they keep coming with us because these are persistent human issues. Who am I? Who, how do you think of me? How are you assessing me? Am I safe? Where the hell am I? What the hell am I doing? Those are persistent human things. And being human in the world that is coming is really important. But how we think about both the being human piece and the interface with this next wave of machinery is really hard. Because the machinery that's coming moves and thinks differently and faster than humans do. The calibration point of how we <coughs> manage the interface of when the machines go, I'm done with the thinking, and the human's like, I'm not ready to take that thinking yet, and I have to consult with some other people, and could I have a cup of coffee, and what do you mean? I need to make that decision right now. So there's some really interesting stuff about how we manage the edge cases, and indeed all of the cases. That means if you were feeling like you might be out of a work, you're not. We're all going to be heavily employed managing all of this, I think, for at least the next 50 years. Which led me to thinking about what will we need to be successful, right? What is it that we're going to need? Boot camps? Yes. Good. Spaces? Man in Chippendale, good luck with that. That's all good. <laughs> we're all going to need all of those things. We're all going to need each other. We're also going to need to think differently about the kind of skills we have. And I was... Well, as part of the thinking about how does technology have a history, I've been thinking about cybernetics and Norbert Wiener a lot recently, which means I've been stuck in the 1950s, which is an interesting place to go hang out. And Norbert, who is in some ways the grandfather of one version of AI, who is one of the early roboticists who helped build computer science at MIT and who was a general all-around idiosyncratic lunatic, but kind of fabulous. In 1950, he staged... Um, a uh, version of the play that gives birth to the word robot. Uh, he restaged Carol Capek's Rossum's Universal Robots at MIT. He wrote a new prologue and he staged the play. And in that new prologue, he basically said this play written in 1921 felt remarkably contemporary in 1950. And I think I've convinced Questacon to restage it this year because I still think it feels remarkably contemporary 100 years later. But in his um, prologue to the play, he has this glorious line where he says, I say that either the engineers must become poets or the poets must become engineers. And if there were ever a kind of line for thinking about where we sit, I think it might be that one. And there's something kind of glorious in imagining what a world would look like where either the engineers would have to become poets or the poets would have to become engineers. I don't think it's quite that simple because that's 1950 and it's now 2018. <laughs> But there is something glorious in imagining that, in some ways, the preeminent scientific thinker of 1950, he understood that it wasn't just STEM. He understood right then that it was the arts that mattered too. And it wasn't because one fed the other, it was because they were mutually constructed. And that, in fact, they were always going to have to be in dialogue. That's why there he was as a scientist putting on a play. He understood it, and I think we get to understand it too. So with that, I want to stop and say thank you. As you promised, you were going to talk right up to 8 o'clock. Mm -hmm. I did. We, we have time for one question. And no, we don't. First. Do we? Do we? Oh, crap. We have, one, we have one minute for that question. Excellent. Well, I, I, yes, then. The answer is yes. <laughs> or possibly no, or 1973. You talked about um, December. the uh, potential for corporations to use uh, data against you. Um, in your experience, what do you think corporations are trying to do to link through generations? So my children, for example, uh, are there any attempts to try and link my data to my uh, future 
generation? Um, not that I'm aware of. And I think, frankly, governments do that more than companies do at this moment in time. And I think what's interesting is to imagine the cultures in which that happens as part of cultural practice. So one of the ways to think about that answer, and you had the Maya personality profiles up there a minute ago, um, human societies tend to fall onto two spectrums, ones that are intensely individually focused and ones that are highly familial and kinship organised. Um, most of the societies in the world fall on the familial and kin, not radical individualism. What that tends to mean is in many societies in the world there are remarkable ways in which one is always and already socially constituted and not by your individualness but by your relations. So a better question would have been to ask me what are people doing to track relations, not kin, but you didn't ask that and I only got to answer one question and I'm done. Yay, go me! <laughs> Aha, just like that. <laughs> Thank you very much, Genevieve.